is both Cambridge and Stanford in molecular biology, I'm sorry, molecular imaging. And she's been a group leader at Cambridge, uh, where she's jointly appointed as a professor of biomedical physics and environment of physics in Cambridge here and also in Cancer Research UK. So uh, Professor Bondic has a team called the Vision Lab here at Cambridge, um, which develops novel imaging approaches to help us understand about tumor evolution. Uh, the Vision Lab is also active in like translate their findings into clinical trials. And she was awarded the CRUK Future Leaders in Cancer Research Prize and SPIE Early Career Achievement Award in recognition of her interdisciplinary research innovation in such a field that involves like optics and imaging and uh, like uh, biology. And I guess she know a lot more than I do. So, and now let's hear directly from her about seeing early cancer in a new light. Go ahead, thanks so much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and also for the opportunity to come and, and speak to you all about our research. Um, I hope that I can tell you a little bit more about the approaches that we're taking to understand early cancer better and develop new technologies that can help us to detect it even earlier and hopefully at a point at which we can make a curative intervention. So as uh, was described, my team are interested in developing new imaging technologies we have to combine these with different computational analysis methods in order to uh, apply them to understand the earliest stages of tumor evolution. So the tools that we use are primarily multispectral imaging tools. And for those who haven't come across that before, here's a kind of accessible image of multispectral imaging. This is an image of the sun taken by NASA at a range of different wavelengths from the optical at around 600 nanometers all the way down to the deep UV at about 10 nanometers. And you can appreciate the contrast that you get from different regions of the sun varies dramatically from the left-hand side of the diagram in the optical through to the deep UV on the right-hand side of the diagram. So resolving according to different wavelengths of light provides us with a higher degree of contrast and allows us to pick out different pieces of information about a scene that we're viewing. Interesting to us, and there are different ways that you can go about it when you want to apply multispectral imaging in biological tissue. So just to give you an overview of what we look at in the lab, we use tools such as photoacoustics, where you can combine the excitation of tissue with light and detection through sound in order to do imaging of really deep tissue objects. But you can also take your light directly to the site of interest where you want to make a measurement via an endoscope um, and detect the reflected light and light that's undergone a range of other optical interactions in order to enhance the contrast for early disease. In order to make advances in these areas, we adapt some new tools and technologies from optics and photonics and combine them with advances in biophysical modeling and machine learning in order to connect the signals that we measure uh, to the biology that's underpinning that change. To do that, we make measurements in both preclinical models, by which I mean mouse models of cancer, and also in first in human clinical trials. So what I'll present to you today is focused on our work in endoscopy using new advances in photonics and nanophotonics in particular, and the results that we've got from applying these in humans and how we might move forward with that in the future. So in overall summary, the outline of my talk will be to try to convince you of the power of optics, uh, to particularly to visualize hemoglobin as a molecule in the body and why that's relevant for early cancer detection. I'll then introduce one of the translatable approaches that we've been working on for spectral endoscopy. We have a whole palette of different tools that we try to measure these spectral changes in an endoscope, which is not a trivial um, thing to do. And I'll just introduce you to two of those. Um, and then I'll finally conclude with some of the results from applying these in humans and how this might go forward in the future. So why do we want to measure hemoglobin in the first place? Well, solid tumors, as they're developing, require a vascular network. They require a blood supply, as all tissues in our bodies do, in order to gain oxygen and nutrients and also to remove metabolic waste. And this diagram helps to illustrate the difference between a vascular architecture in a normal tissue and that in a tumor. So in a normal healthy organ, we'll have an arterial supply, which will divide up into vascular structures down to a capillary network, and then a venous drainage, which will allow the body to remove metabolic waste uh, and drain back um, around the circulatory system. In a tumor, this is much more chaotic because as the cells in a tumor mass start to proliferate and develop, 
they'll reach a point at which they need to stimulate the growth of new blood vessels. And in order to achieve that, they'll secrete factors that will signal to the local biological environment that we should start the growth of new blood vessels. And so that means kind of from all around the tumor, there will be blood vessels sprouting and developing to try to feed into that tumor mass. So as a result, we have a very inefficient orientation and geometry of vessels. We can have a very steep longitudinal oxygen gradient because as the blood flows into the tumor, the metabolic demand of the tissue is so high with all of its divisions that the cells are undergoing that it will suck the oxygen out very rapidly. And we can also have changes in uh, like red blood cell viscosity, um, resistance to flow, which overall paint a picture of an, a kind of an organ that has a very inefficient blood supply, that has a very poor utilization of the, of the oxygen that's being supplied. What that leads to in practice is a large number of vessels that are beyond the diffusion limit of oxygen from a local blood vessel. The diffusion limit of oxygen is around between 100 and 200 microns, and in this sparse vascular network in the tumor bed, you have many cells that are in a completely anoxic environment. So they're completely deprived of oxygen. The result of that is a change in the metabolic and the biological properties of those cancer cells, which leads to something called hypoxic stress and has been associated in many different cancers with poor outcomes. So tumors that have these large areas of hypoxic tissue can have a um, higher rate of metastasis, so dissemination of the disease throughout the body. They can have poorer response to radiotherapy, which requires the presence of oxygen in order to generate the free radicals that it uses to kill cells. And it can have a poorer response to chemotherapy as well, because many of the DNA damaging agents that we give as chemotherapy drugs also require the presence of oxygen. So it's relatively important in the progression of cancer that we can understand the vascular network, how it's structured, how it functions, and how well it can develop oxygen. Now, the reason that optics, I think, is very good for this is that hemoglobin within red blood cells is a very strong absorber of light. So hemoglobin itself is an absorbing, iron-containing, aromatic poly um, porphyrin registry system, and that changes its properties when oxygen is bound. And this change in conformation according to oxygen binding leads to differential absorption spectra according to the presence or absence of, of oxygen. And what you'll see here is that blood is very, very absorbing in the visible range and starts to diminish as you go out uh, into the near infrared. This region here is um, known as a so-called optical window in tissue where light can actually propagate quite deeply. So we're, we're not optically transparent. So in the wavelengths of light that we see, I can't see through you, you can't see through me. Um, but actually, if you go redder and redder and redder, um, you'll see that like red light can already propagate quite easily through my finger. And if we go further to the red, we actually become much more tissue transparent because water has an absorption minimum of absorption in this range. And when you go beyond about 600, many of the biological molecules that typically absorb light in the visible region um, will drop off in their ability to absorb and fluoresce. So this region between about 650 and 900 is really optimal for trying to get light into biological tissue. And it happens to be a region in which oxy and deoxyhemoglobin have rather different properties. However, for the purposes of endoscopy, um, we can use any of these wavelength ranges because we're taking the light directly to the site of interest. So we're immediately imaging the tissue in front of us. Now, the challenge with conventional endoscopy is that we use imaging systems that replicate what our eyes could see if we were able to look inside the body. So if you're squeamish, close your eyes now because I'm going to show you some endoscopy pictures. So these are some pictures from patients with something called Barrett's esophagus. So this is where acid refluxes up from the stomach and causes changes to the lining of the esophagus, which change the, type, the cell type effectively from a, a nice um, flat squamous epithelium to a more columnar structure. And it leads to lots of biological changes in the tissue, which increase the likelihood that the individual patient will develop esophageal cancer. So they, these patients are subjected to a surveillance program where they're called in for endoscopy every three to five years. Um, and during that surveillance endoscopy, um, the white light image that you see here, so composed of red, green, and blue color channels to replicate our eyes, uh, looks something like this. And if you're looking at this, even as an expert, it can be pretty hard to detect where the disease is. So on the left-hand example, it's over here on the right. Here it's over on the left. And in the final image, it's again over on the right. Um, and there are odd structural abnormalities throughout all of these organs, which would make it hard to discern actually where that disease is. And the reason this is a problem is that through this surveillance program, we know that we have a miss rate for these earliest signs of disease, these dysplastic conditions of about 
So we're bringing all of these people in to surveil them for early disease, but we're only really good at finding it once it actually generates cancer. However, if we can detect these earlier stages, so this restricted early cancer dysplasia or low-grade dysplasia, the endoscopist can actually put a set of um, biopsy forceps down inside the patient and cut the suspicious region out, and then the patient will effectively be cured. So they will be prevented from going on to get full-blown cancer. So what we'd ideally like to be able to do is improve the contrast for that disease. And the one way we can do that is by better interrogating the contrast of the presence of blood. So in a conventional white light image, you're shining light between 400 and 700 nanometers, so in the visible range, and you're integrating this into red, green, and blue color channels. And that gives you a generic kind of pink with a slightly darker pink for disease and a slightly lighter pink for not disease. You can also apply a technique called narrowband imaging where you actually restrict the wavelengths of light that you illuminate with to wavelengths where the blood content is strong and the absorption of light is the same for oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. And what that allows you to do is provide a very high resolution of the vasculature. Um, so if you look over on the right hand side here, here's the white light image. Um, and this is a narrow band image. So you can immediately see that the contrast that you're, you can perceive is different. And if I zoom in, you can actually see that you see the, the red vascular uh, networks actually highlighted by using these two narrow color channels. So we said, okay, well, what if we take this one step further, rather than having a qualitative picture that a clinician has got to interpret, why don't we actually measure the, the spectral response of the tissue um, at this resolution and pick out the absorption spectra of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin so that we can quantify how much blood is present and the um, oxygenation of that blood and see whether that gives us a more um, objective metric of the presence of disease compared to the, the visual interpretation. So that's where we come to trying to apply spectral imaging in endoscopy. And the challenge here is that a spectrometer is typically quite a large piece of equipment and an endoscope has to fit down your throat. Um, so there are two ways in which you can do endoscopic imaging. You can use uh, what's called a chip on tip. So effectively, it's the same camera as you find in your smartphone, miniaturized camera. They stick it on the end of the tube and stick the tube down your throat. And the, the camera will then be accompanied by um, a couple of LEDs, or there'll be a light guide that will put the light in from the outside. The other way that you can test the new endoscopic method and was the original way that we used to do endoscopy is using a fiber optic bundle. So you guide the light in via a fiber optic and we typically use bundles of tens of thousands of individual fiberlets and each uh, fiber is then a pixel on your image. Um, and you relay the image back through that same bundle um, and image it onto a camera outside of the patient. Now, from a commercial perspective, if you were going to create one of these in a company, you would do it this way, because um, that's the way that the majority of cameras um, in endoscopes are, are developed these days. But from an academic perspective, if you, if you want to do a research project and understand how the spectra actually change, you've got a practical consideration is that how, how can I measure it in a patient without having to create a commercial device that goes through medical regulatory approval in a process that takes about a decade. Um, so the practical consideration is that you start with the baby scope um, because you can use uh, an existing commercially available medically approved architecture, which allows you to introduce a fiber optic bundle into an existing <coughs> endoscope. So what I do here is I take the, um, uh, the endoscope that my clinical collaborator uses, and the accessory channel where they would normally introduce those biopsy forceps to do resections, we introduce a fiber optic bundle. So the way that we do that is we use this disposable catheter that is uh, clinically approved. We introduce an imaging fiber bundle. We introduce an illumination. And we still have a working channel so that they can introduce the forceps if they want to. So we now have a way to um, apply light and relay light out back out of the patient. So then the question is, how do you take spectrally resolved data at high speed in a patient who is breathing, heart beating, their esophagus is moving around, the entire device is being handheld by a person who's moving it up and down. And if you ever watch one of these procedures, it's like going on a roller coaster. Like they really dive down into the gut with the camera very, very quickly and then pull it out very, very fast. Um, so it makes me feel like motion sick just watching them do it. So what we wanted to do was be able to maintain the spatial resolution of the device, um, but also may add spectral resolution. So the way that we did this was by taking the output of the imaging fiber bundle. So now imagine I've got a picture of 10,000 fiberlets and I relay that picture onto um, it through an objective lens. So I magnify that picture 
and then I um, split it between two different cameras. One camera is just the conventional wide field camera that will take a standard image that doesn't have any spectral data. And the other one is a spectrograph attached, attached to a, a second really, camera. So in the spectrograph, what happens is that I put a slit over the um, image that I'm measuring. So my circular endoscope that has a picture of many fibrolets has a slit placed down the middle of it. And I can scan that slit around in the patient in order to obtain my spectral data. Whereas my wide field data collects the entire picture in the same frame. That is then dispersed across this 2D camera. So effectively one dimension encodes wavelength and a second dimension encodes the spatial position. And then I can illuminate my sample either by passing light through the endoscope itself, or when we're doing bench testing, we just stick a, a lamp next to it um, outside. What you then do is use the wide field image of the entire set of fibrolets in order to reconstruct and compensate for the motion that's happening. So if I've got a live view of the camera of the entire imaging fiber bundle, as that moves around, I can then calculate the geometric transformation matrices between adjacent scenes. So if my scene rotates, zooms in, judders a bit, um, I can reconstruct that into what happened in the panorama. And what I then do is I take the spectral data that I've acquired and I apply those geometric transformations to the spectral data in order to reconstruct what we call a hypercube. So a, a data cube that involves the spatial information, but also the wavelength information at every single position um, that the device has moved across. And this is some examples where here's the wide field reconstructed image of a standard resolution target that we would use to measure the spatial resolution of our imaging system. And here's what happens when you apply the um, transformation into the spectral data. Now to test that we can actually maintain the fidelity of the spectra and the spatial resolution, we then did some bench testing where we took some tubes filled with blood and oxygenated them to different levels um, and then measured them with the system, essentially just by scanning um, the object across. Um, and there you get a series of spectra with different absorbance profiles that then correlate with the actual oxygenation level in there. And we, and we extract the oxygenation simply by fitting the known absorption spectra of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to the measured spectra that we acquire. We then did some very simple testing using biopsy samples that were taken uh, from patients and measured their spectra and showed that in the normal healthy tissue, you get a different spectrum than you get in the early um, inflammatory state, which is what these people are being surveilled for. And again, you get a different um, spectrum when you get towards cancer. And these are significantly different between cancer and all the other sort of spectral types that you could see. But these were in a very limited number of biopsy samples. What we really wanted to do was do it in vivo. So you can imagine if you extract tissue from a patient, blood's not flowing anymore. So it's a bit of a poor uh, way to actually validate the system. So we did first some practical testing, and um, this time using um, a pig esophagus. So you can buy, um, uh, the, the off cuts from the, the butcher of different bits of animals that we don't typically eat. Um, so here's an example of um, an esophagus from the pig that came from the abattoir. Um, so there's the esophagus, there's a stomach attached, so it gives it some sort of structural integrity. Um, and we can stick our, um, our endoscope testing system with our hyperspectral endoscope threaded through it um, into that. And this is the way you see the illumination in the, um, in the esophagus here. And we can actually then scan it around to confirm that when we're, we're holding it freehand and moving it in a tissue, albeit not a living one, um, we can reconstruct the images of the lumen, as you would expect, looking down it. And we can also reconstruct spectral images of that same lumen. Um, and we can make do the imaging in, in real time in a way that could be interpreted. So I'll come back later to how we apply this in the clinic, but I then wanted to give you a bit of a more, bit more view on how we might translate this into the chip on tip um, side of things. So if we go back to this concept of a chip on tip where we've got a camera actually at the tip of the endoscope, what you would typically be doing here is having a conventional color camera, um, or you can also have a monochrome camera where you um, got, you, um, tailor the illumination instead. So you rapidly scan to red, green, and blue light sources. But here, if we assume that we've got a color filter array that um, is replicating what the colors our eyes see, there's absolutely no reason why we can't create a color filter array that better samples the spectrum such that we can resolve these contrast changes that we're trying to look for. The challenge here is that if you want to create multiple different color channels other than RGB, which all of the standard founders are set up to create, it's actually quite a cumbersome process. 
So typically these um, color filters are created um, through a process called lithography. This is where you have uh, a mask here that masks off the pixels that you don't want to expose. Um, and then you have um, exposure here um, to actually define the pixels. The silicon pixels on the camera are sitting underneath the color filter pixels that are put on top. And those can either be formed by applying color, colored pigments in, into um, this spectral pattern or by forming dielectric stacks to filter the light in that way. But the problem is for every color you want to apply, you have to do the entire process again. And so from a manufacturing standpoint, it's actually quite um, hard to do. So we thought about, OK, well, if we're going to take spectral data and we're going to want to have more than just R, G and B, we're going to need to have a manufacturing process that would allow us to do this in a much more simple way. So to achieve this, we created a, a, a different manufacturing process that allows you to create um, Fabry Perot cavities. So anyone who's um, done the optics uh, course here in 1B will probably have come across these. Um, these are cavities where the, the height of the cavity is directly related to the wavelength of light that can be coupled through it. So you have a, um, two metal mirrors um, and an insulator cavity in the middle. Now with these Fabry Perot cavities, um, you can create these um, um, as small filters on chip like this by going through a lithographic process as well. So this is known as a, a metal insulator metal cavity process or a MIM process. Um, so you have silver mirrors on either side, and then you have a, a resist, which is effectively a polymer um, that's the insulator between these different materials. And you apply an exposure dose, either of electrons or of light, depending on whether you're using electron beam lithography or photolithography. And that exposure dose reacts in the resist, which is your insulator material. Um, and it either reacts, um, it can be a positive or negative resist, or it can react to, to keep the material present when you do a wash step, or it can react in order to allow the material to be washed away and um, unreacted material is left. But effectively, what this is, the way this is normally used in lithography is as a binary tool. So you either have the presence of the material or you don't have the presence of the material. And what we did was actually use the, um, the curve, the resist sensitivity curve to say, well, we can actually do a dose dependent um, flood exposure across an entire array to create many different cavities of many different heights at once if we can carefully tune the response of the resist. So through a lot of um, dedicated clean room optimization, it, it, we've now got to a point where it's possible for us to choose an arbitrary set of wavelengths and then fabricate uh, a, a sensor with an appropriate array of color filters on it. So here you can see like a grayscale pro profile that shows you the range of exposure dose applied to a chip. Um, here's then the optical transmission microscopy that shows you the color that those filters give um, and the atomic force microscopy that shows you how high the cavities are. And these are just spaced out so it's a bit easier to view than in a dense pixel array. So here's just some pictures of how that looks in practice. So we can just it, we can also easily create a red, green and blue color filter array. That's what's currently used on these cameras. Um, and you can do imaging of that to image, for example, uh, a color checker chart, which shows you the, the visualization of the most common colors encountered in uh, our world around us. We can also then start to tailor and select, let's say like a three by three matrix of different colors where we now have nine spectral samples. Um, of course, in this approach, you're trading spatial and spectral resolution. So ideally what you want is actually know what, what spectra you're targeting and then use the smallest number of color filters that are possible to solve the optimization algorithm to do the inversion in order to calculate the properties that you want. You can also scale this. So this is an actual like, silicon wafer where this has been fabricated. Um, and here's some results from doing it in photolithography with a silicon wafer. So then what would we want to actually tailor for if we were doing this in practice? Well, we think that it's really important from an endoscopy point of view, if you're thinking about clinical translation, to maintain your white light imaging performance. So you still kind of want to have a Bayer filter pattern of the red, green, green, blue to replicate what the eyes can see because the endoscopist has been used to looking at this since these things were created decades ago. So you don't want to change the amount of training that the endoscopist has to do. You want them to still be able to see what they normally see, but you want to give them added information on top. So one way to do that is to um, subsample the different wavelength ranges within the red, green and blue, such that you can bin a kind of super pixel of red, green and blue, but you can also resolve spectral information across that range. So this is the concept here that you would have a, 
a standard color camera with also a near infrared response. And this is interesting as an aside, if you want to do targeted fluorescence imaging, where we typically use that near infrared region where tissue doesn't have many absorbing molecules of its own. Um, or you can do a spectrally resolved imaging. And this is an example of a chip that's been fabricated with that design. So this is um, a, a larger version of what you have in your smartphones. Um, we then can do the optical microscopy and show that it has a different color response. And when we actually um, plot that out, this is the RGB response of those big pixels. And you can image it through um, a, a super continuum light source, which essentially has a very narrow band tuning. And you can see that different pixels light up as you scan through different wavelengths of light. So you can really see the different pixels um, that have been present on that camera. Um, and you can do some very simple image processing to extract the, um, the white light imaging. So that's two different kind of approaches to measuring spectral data, um, one through the baby scope and one um, with a chip on tip. So the, as I mentioned, the, the baby scope approach is the one that I can readily put into a patient because I don't have to go through a process of like miniaturizing it, fabricating it and getting it um, signed off as a medical device. I can use an existing um, approach for that. The other reason that the baby scope approach is good is that I can get the full spectral range because I'm using a full spectrometer. So I'm effectively using a diffraction grating to disperse the light um, over a very wide range of wavelengths. Whereas with the chip on tip approach, I have to sub choose a subset of, it, of wavelengths. Otherwise I'll have a very poor spatial resolution. So what's the pathway to actually get these things over into clinic? Well, we have the discovery domain where we conceive the idea and think that we um, have something worth doing and we can uh, build an instrument that will allow us to measure it. But that's only the start of the process. We then have a validation domain where we actually have to show um, both technically that the instrument can measure with appropriate precision and accuracy so it can uh, accurately reflect what's um, happening under, in the biology, but also if I make the same measurement on different days, on different people, at different places in the world, that I can actually measure the same thing over and over again. Um, so there's two sort of facets of validation, technical and biological, and there are different steps that you go through, typically using test objects, which are called phantoms, um, using tissue taken out from the patient, so ex vivo tissue, using living model systems, such as the mouse models, um, and then taking first measurements from human. And then there's two sort of big hurdles on the pathway to application in a healthcare system. The first gap is where you want to go from, I do a measurement with my clinical collaborator here in Cambridge, and I do it on a few patients, and I get some promising results. And I want to get to doing a multi-center trial where I use my device in many different hospitals and gather more data from more patients. And then the next gap is where you get to kind of qualification of the device where you say you can actually use the optical imaging biomarker or OIB um, that you measure in order to manage patients in the healthcare system. So obviously, we're very far from this end. We're way up here. Um, and we decided to go through to the single center multi um, single center study um, for first in human a few years ago now. So this was designed to ass actually assess what the biomarkers might be in early disease and how this could be used. So this study started back in 2018 um, and data was accrued over two and a half years until COVID scuppered us, as it scuppered many things. Um, but we collected over that time data from 20 patients and then spent the subsequent year analyzing it. And what our aims were to assess the feasibility of actually doing this baby scope imaging, and then also to try to evaluate how the, the spectral data that we acquire could be associated with disease. So what does the, the trial actually look like? This is a very um, post schematic of my clinical collaborator, Massey. Uh, Massey DiPietro is a gastroenterologist who works in imaging surveillance at Adambrooks and is really interested in testing new imaging techniques to improve early esophageal cancer detection. Um, so here's the, the regular endoscope that comes down inside the patient. The patient's um, normally uh, lying down, which is, as you see here. And our um, imaging fiber bundle goes down inside the working channel here. The um, end of the polyscope that I showed you before is like this. So you have the imaging fiber coming out and we have the uh, imaging optics coming through there. We have a screen that displays the regular white light image. So you can see our scope coming through the end of the endoscope using his chip on tip camera. Um, and then we have an additional display that has our image data as well as our spectral data placed on it. 
Um, so the light comes in through the illumination system here and then is imaged back onto the setup where we have the white light camera uh, and the spectrometer. And that's where the spectral data is being dispersed and collected. So the way that we designed this trial was such that um, Massey would go in with his uh, endoscope. He would identify some suspicious lesions that he could see. So we're not addressing that whole 50% miss rate thing because if he can't see it, then it's in the miss category anyway. Um, but it, we've got to start somewhere. He would then mark the regions um, that he would be planning to image uh, using a, some cautery marking. So effectively making a small burn on the, the tissue so that we could find the region again. We would then introduce our baby scope and measure spectral data from those marked regions. And we would take a biopsy from those, which would then go for diagnosis by a pathologist, which is the gold standard pathway for diagnosis of the disease. And we would then in our spatial um, region, so we would have accumulated um, optical data from this uh, whole area, and we can compare the spectra that we measure with the diagnostic report. So the first thing to say about all of this is that clinicians never agree. Um, so if we have an, an endoscopist saying this is suspicious and we send it to a histopathologist, um, they may say, actually, no, it's just the inflammatory condition. It's not cancerous. And um, if we have an endoscopist saying this is a control, completely healthy region, they may come back and say, no, it's actually got dysplasia um, and so on. Um, so there's not only is there not concordance necessarily between the endoscopist and the pathologist, there's also not necessarily concordance between multiple pathologists. So you actually end up having to go through quite a procedure in order to get data that you can be confident with and make sure your pathologists uh, agree and that you exclude cases where there are um, disagreements between the two measurements. So here are the actual spectra that we measured. Um, here is the normal squamous epithelium of the esophagus. Here is the, the Barrett's esophagus that's non-dysplastic, so there's no abnormality present in that region, according to the endoscopist and the pathologist. Um, and here's the Barrett's esophagus where you've got neoplasia. So here there's some form of abnormality, either in early disease or more established cancer. And these are averages over about 750 spectra taken from 15 patients who remained when we um, actually got to the point of doing data curation. So the first thing to note is that you also then have to think very carefully about the variation within and between patients. And these are just some summary statistics that show you that um, in um, non-dysplastic Barrett and in neoplasia, you're gonna get more variation when you go between regions in the same patient than you are when you look at data in the same region of one patient. And that same when you then go from variation within one patient and then you look at variation between patients for the same disease category and also unsurprisingly there's a lot more variation between cancer in different people than there is in variation between healthy tissue in different people what do we do with all of these spectra once we've acquired them then well there are various different routes you can take to analyze them one route that i find more kind of satisfying is that we can take the biophysical modeling approach so we can build a model that describes how the spectra should look according to the presence of different molecules in the tissue. And these are some example, example spectra. If you go through um, the process of modifying the oxygenation of blood um, from essentially 0% oxygenation to 100% oxygenation. So you see the appearance of this strong double peak structure from the oxygenated blood. You can also then model changes in the size of the vessels from very thin vessels shown with thin lines up to very thick vessels shown with thick lines. And you can model how the photons propagate through the tissue when you have these different parameters present in different vascular networks. And you can also then model how the light is scattering in that accordingly, but I won't show any of the scattering data here, I'll just show the absorption data. So this allows you to map from the spectra that you're measuring in the different disease states to both oxygenation and blood content, as well as the, the overall vascular size, because we know that that also changes with disease. So what was interesting in these early disease settings was that actually we saw very little difference in the oxygen saturation of the blood in those different um, tissue types. So there's potentially very little difference in the metabolic demand of those tissue types in the way that we were looking at it. But we did see a very big change in vessel radius. So the radius of the vessels decreased as we went to the inflammatory condition and then actually increased again as we went into the cancerous tissue. And this is likely due to the fact that um, if you look at this, this is a cross section of the tissue in the esophagus where we have the, the normal um, tissue example at the top where you've got your, these kind of flat cells um, that you can see kind of stacked on top of each other um, compared to in the, the reflux condition in Barrett's where you have a kind of more columnar structure. 
Um, and in this um, structure, you get actually propagation of vessels outwards towards the, the tissue um, at the surface. Um, and these start to actually mature as you go towards cancer. So that's why we get um, thinner vessels, which are kind of new forming up in the inflammatory condition. And then in the cancerous state, they start to actually become bigger where they're maturing a bit more. Um, and that is reflected in a higher relative blood volume fraction in the different disease states as well. So what we're doing at the moment is a study to try and actually validate how the imaging spectra that we acquire directly detect um, and reflect them in the histology. So this is then a, another cross-sectional view where um, the outside of the esophagus is on this side um, and, it, and we cross through from the mucosa into the tissue. Um, and we can actually do some vessel staining. So this brown color here highlights the blood vessels. Um, and using a, um, a neural network, we can then actually extract the segmentation of those blood vessels and quantify them according to the position um, and then link back the position of the measured vessels to the spectral measurements that we make. Um, so that would allow us to um, understand how, like, for example, vessel size changes in the specimen compared to how our biophysical modeling of vessel size changes. So do the two actually agree or is our model flawed? Something else that you can do with the spectral data um, and that you might imagine doing on the fly in, in the future in the clinical application is to um, apply a classifier, which allows you to say, based on this spectrum, is it normal healthy tissue, inflamed tissue or cancer? Um, and you can do that. There are um, various different ways you can apply these classifiers and we've tried a whole range of them. And this is just an example of a, a convolutional neural network approach to do it. And this is a collaboration with the University of Oxford where they have an, an expert in applying machine learning to endoscopic uh, imaging. So as you can see here, the algorithm is very good at telling you what's normal, um, but kind of less accurate at telling you uh, what's abnormal. Um, and you could imagine that that well reflects our data set where um, in our relatively lim limited sample of uh, 20 patients, we have lots of examples of spectra that we've acquired from normal tissue, um, but we don't have a whole lot of disease. Um, that's just the way that you, you have these data sets. So no matter how you split it up for training and test, it's not actually very many samples to show it of the, um, the two disease states. And so this is something that we could expand on if we were to collect more data in a future clinical trial. In that same study, we also had one of these multispectral cameras um, applied, which had these narrow multispectral responses. Now, the challenge of combining a, an imaging fiber bundle and a multispectral camera means that the image resolution is awful, um, but it does just show the principle that you can resolve it with these um, different cameras. So we went through this same kind of classification approach um, using a slightly different um, method. Um, and we were able to actually classify with relatively high accuracy in this case, taking into account the imaging data as well as the spectral data. Um, and this is some regions that we picked out to show in the healthy tissue, you can get an almost 100% classification accuracy in the inflamed tissue again, and in the cancer, slightly poorer performance, but still pretty good. So this shows the principle that if you have the spatial information as well as the spectral information, you can do a bit better, um, but this is something that we then need to progress forward to, to validate. We also applied this in a completely um, different setting at the other end of the gastrointestinal tract in the colon, because um, one could say, well, if you see these vascular changes in the upper GI tract, why wouldn't you see them in the lower GI tract? Um, and we do indeed see them there. So this is exactly the same, except now we're going through a colonoscope. This is actual photo of the, uh, the imaging setup uh, that you see there. And there it is on the trolley adjacent to the endoscopy trolley that's normally used in the clinic. And here's some example of those wide field images that we use with the color camera and the panorama that we can stitch back together when we actually um, do our geometric transformations um, and the reconstructive panorama of the hyperspectral data and some example spectra. So we're actually able to do much better imaging in the colon because it's a much wider diameter. So you can scan your endoscope around a lot more freely than you can do in the esophagus. So that's why I, I don't show any, you any in, images from the esophagus and um, they're too small to actually see anything reasonable. Whereas in the colon, you can actually start to see the lumen. You can see the folds in the lumen um, that are needed for peristalsis. And here are some uh, findings then from, in this case, it was a smaller number of patients. We had about seven patients. This was a study we did in the US. Um, so we had a, a, a limited time window in which we could apply it. Um, but again, you can see the spectral features here with the double peaks for the hemoglobin. 
And when we uh, run this again through a classification approach, you can uh, appreciate on this graph on the right here that the, the blood heavy regions where the polyps have been resected differentiate themselves from the normal tissue in, in green here, and then the actual polyps before they're resected on the other side here. Um, and any specular reflections that are just reflections from the tissue that haven't interacted with the, the tissue um, are, are separated over up here. Now, one challenge of all of this is that we're collecting data in uh, three dimensions and an endoscopist can only view a 2D image. So what is it that you want to show them? Do you want to show them a kind of binarized yes, no, here is um, cancer and here is not? Well, you better have really good classification accuracy if you're going to try and do that. Um, another thing you can do is map the spectral data onto a, a wider palette of colors. So when you do red, green and blue imaging, you're mapping your full spectral data into just three colors. But you could take a full palette of um, representative colors and map onto a wider number so that the clinician is still making a color based interpretation, but they have a larger number of colors to choose from when they're doing their interpretation. And this is something that we tried again, um, training a, a convolutional neural network, which would allow us to input the spectral imaging data um, and generate just a classified image along that slit that's being applied for the spectrometer. So as they wave their, their um, endoscope around, you can compose a reconstructed image. Here's the visual image um, in this case, and here's the classified image according to the different colors. Um, and that's how it might look to a clinician who's looking down a lumen. Um, so there's there'll be some color mapping and we've shown quite nicely that you can map the different disease states to broadly different colors that might help with kind of the human interpretation factor of the procedure. So um, I then wanted to talk a little bit about how we connect these two strands of research. So how do we connect the spectroscopy data that we're getting from the baby scope to this concept of having a chip on tip camera or a multi spectral camera that's much more restricted in the spectral samples that it can make. Well, now we have a reasonably comprehensive set of spectra. We could start to investigate whether if we choose a subset of spectral bands from within that, can we optimize the contrast beyond what you can see with a standard color camera? And so this was the initial view of this that we did a couple of years ago, and we've since developed this a lot further. So we said, OK, we have three color channels that we know that we can use in an endoscope. But what if red, green, and blue are the wrong color channels? What if we try a different set of color channels? So we allowed uh, an optimization algorithm to go through um, with three color channels and say, what if I take three channels, but I allow um, the algorithm to vary both the position and the bandwidth of those channels um, across the, the range of feasibly manufacturable filters? Um, so I go through this optimization process, and then I simulate what the image could look like um, and what contrast I could achieve. So the way we do this is using um, a color mapping model. And I'm going to show you the example of what comes out from it. Now, in a white light camera, I've iterated many times, we have red, green, and blue color responses. Here's the actual spectra of the red, green, and blue color responses that you typically find in a white light camera. Now, here's a, a, an artificial image that we've created where we say, OK, the left-hand bank is squamous, and then the right-hand bank um, replicates the disease condition. So what we're trying to do in the clinic is identify abnormal tissue or cancer on a background of inflamed tissue. And if I apply these um, white light um, color filters to my spectral data that I've acquired from the different disease types and then map them onto this, I see a color contrast, um, a visual color contrast of about three. And that's uh, replicating the kind of the pink color contrast that I see in a white light image. Now, if I go into narrowband imaging, where I'm just illuminating at those blood concentration wavelengths and do the same thing, I get a slight contrast enhancement, which is what I showed you earlier. And there's a, the contrast enhancement of that equivalent image. So we get about twice as much contrast if we use narrowband imaging. Now, if I choose an arbitrary set of wavelengths from the spectral data set, um, any three related to um, the optimization algorithm, I can potentially get a color contrast of up to 27. So I have an about ninefold improvement over the standard white light imaging if I just choose the filters better. You can take this even further, and we created an open access toolbox to actually do this kind of optimization process um, more broadly. So you can input a hypercube to that toolbox, and you can give it free parameters as to how you want to optimize your multispectral filters, 
give it different number of bands, different center wavelengths, different filter response shapes, different bandwidths, different mosaic spatial patterns, different algorithms for demosaicing, blah, 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 blah. And then you can take your hypercube and you can image it through your theoretical filter array and go through this optimization process to actually create a mosaic image, which you can then recover the either the abundance of the different molecules, as I've shown you with the biophysical modeling, or you can do a reconstruction of um, according to the red, green and blue colors, or you can do a classification accuracy, et cetera. Um, and you can do a joint spectral spatial optimization of the whole process uh, using this toolbox. So I hope I maybe convinced you by waffling on for rather a long time that spectral endoscopy ha does have some potential for application in um, detection of early disease. Um, but there are a few things that we'd like to do in future. We'd like to actually expand the cross-validation of the spectral signatures that we me me measured. Um, we're actually thinking of doing this now using the chip-on-tip -tip approach, but we could continue with the baby scope method. We'd like to do some um, more detailed analysis of what causes the optical properties in early disease. And I showed you a brief example of that with the histopathology sections where we're doing those vessel analyses. Um, but the nice thing about using optics is there are excellent simulation tools available that when you know something about the tissue architecture, you can actually do uh, run simulations of how the photons interact with the tissue and understand the difference between your simulated data and what you're measuring in order to improve your bio biophysical models. Um, I already said that. Um, we can also do some initial testing of the chip on tip and the test in other disease settings. I showed you some data from the colon, um, but there's also interested in using this um, from clinicians in bladder cancer uh, detection um, uh, using for cystoscopy and also in the lung. So there's a whole range of different ways in which you could try and do this. So before I finish, I just want to take a, a couple of minutes to say, you know, where is this going? Well, in the future, what we'd like to be able to do is move beyond this very simple white light endoscope. We'd like to make it smaller. We'd like to make it uh, in higher resolution. And we'd like to create me measurements that are depth resolved to understand how far into the tissue the disease is penetrating. So here we could actually measure the cellular resolution by doing a higher magnification endoscopy procedure. And here we could do depth resolved imaging through the tissue. The challenge is that each of these requires an additional device. So the patient's lying there, they have the tube down their throat, they go through their endoscopy, you take it out, and then you say, would you like another one? Um, and you say, okay, well, then now you can get your depth resolved information, now you can get your um, high resolution information, um, and you lengthen the procedure time, you also lengthen the discomfort for the patient who's having these different um, things going in and out. But there's no reason with like modern technologies that we couldn't try to build a device that would do all of these things in one. Um, so one way to improve the resolution is to take inspiration from methods that are used in super resolution microscopy and apply them to generate super resolution endoscopy. Um, and this is just a bench testing setup that we built to show that using an LED light, you could actually achieve super resolution imaging because so far the majority of the testing is done with coherent sources. Um, and in this setup, we were able to show that in the super resolution imaging with an LED, you can indeed generate a higher resolution profile with the super resolution approach than you can in the wide field. And you could imagine then deploying this in an endoscopy type environment where you could do different colors of LED. And then you could use the innovation that we had here using diffractive optical elements to modify the optical field in a way that you could um, generate super resolution spots in order to maximize the resolution with which you're imaging the tissue. And we showed that you can switch between doing this in the wide field and in a super resolution manner on the bench. So then the question is, you know, how do you get, how do you miniaturize this? And that's an area of active research. Another thing you can do if you want to go deeper is you can expand out to longer wavelengths. And I told you at the start that there's this really nice window of uh, optical penetration in the sort of near infrared and it actually out also into the short wave infrared before water starts absorbing again. Um, but at the moment, it, that region corresponds nicely with the region in which our cameras don't respond very well. So typical silicon cameras fall off in their response after about 800 nanometers. There are also cameras that pick up after that. Um, but yeah, we can go a bit deeper because we can take advantage of the fact that light scatters less as a function of wavelength. So we can get more ballistic photons into the tissue. So there's been a new innovation last year from Sony, which um, uses a standard ingas camera, which are then usually the shortwave infrared. They normally start at about 1,000 nanometers um, and measure upwards from that. So they cut off the visible. 
But using the innovation from Sony, you can actually now measure both the visible and the shortwave infrared uh, together. And I won't go into huge detail about how that works, but it has a high response over the whole wavelength range of interest, allowing us to do the conventional imaging, but also um, potentially image deeper in tissue. And here's just a really simple example about having how having wider range of spectral information could be useful. Um, here's a set of blueberries where on one side they are uh, nicely ripe and on the other side they are overripe, which is hard to see by eye. But when you measure the water content based on the long wavelength absorption over 1300 nanometers, you can see that the ones on the, um, the, the right have less water absorption than the ones on the left. OK, um, so that's where we're at, at the moment. What things have I told you about in the clinical context that uh, affect what we do? So we might not do um, the most state of the art physics and we might not do the most state of the art engineering. Um, but what we do do is allow uh, adaptations to physics and engineering approaches that allow them to be used in a loud, bright, moving, living environment uh, in real time to give sensible feedback to a clinician. So you have to think carefully about what your contrast mechanism is, what your instrument compatibility is, who's going to operate it, who's going to interpret it, how it's going to be repeatable, reproducible, how you're going to link it into the current standard of care. How, what barriers are you going to face on the way? How are you going to define the optical exposure limits of the light that you put into the patient? How are you going to do quality assurance and testing? What, what representative models can you use? Are there accurate gold standards? What sort of clinical trials can you use? I mean, you have to think about that translational pipeline that I already uh, alluded to and think about how you can use test objects to actually improve the performance along the way there. Okay, so that's me. I've shown you a bit about why I think hemoglobin is uh, really important in, or, or in the progression of early cancer, how we might trans uh, develop a spectral endoscope that could be translated in the future, and what happens when you actually put it in a person. And with that, I'd like to thank a huge number of people who've contributed actively to the research that I've presented, and particularly people who have now uh, left to go on to bigger and better things in other universities. Um, and if you're interested to learn more about what we've done, obviously I'm happy to take questions, but if there's not time, then uh, feel free to email me afterwards. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks, uh, Professor Mondi, for such an interesting topic. It covers like so many uh, <laughs> yeah, of very broad. Experience. Sorry, <laughs> and, and just like wondering, yeah, if any questions, uh, perhaps you can use this mic. Uh, I got you can catch raise your hand first. So Give him his exercise. Got to run up the top and yeah. run down the bottom. Yeah, so there, there definitely are benefits. Um, there are examples of um, colonoscopes, for example, where you have a wider lumen of actually mounting the cameras around the lumen and building up a 360 degree view of the tissue. Um, there are also challenges with doing that, um, mostly towards acceptance by clinicians because it's not what they're used to looking at. Um, in the upper GI tract, there's also, um, as I kind of um, alluded to in uh, uh, this slide, there's a lot of interest in doing these depth resolved information and actually these are done in side view. So you have a laser beam that comes down and you have a mirror that um, scans very, very quickly around the tissue to move a point around. So this is actually achieved by using optical interferometry, which is very it's a simple, like the optical equivalent of ultrasound. So the light comes in and they look at the differences in the path um, between the, um, the light that's coming and a reference arm. Um, so side viewing can be actively used to build up that information. Um, and I think in the longer term, it's possible that it would be much more broadly adopted. Um, but the main resistance is the inertia of the global trained body of endoscopists who are used to looking down a lumen. The other challenge, of course, is that if you're looking to the side, 
you've got to move your endoscope up and down in order to map out the entire 3D structure. Whereas when you look down a lumen, you see much more of the lumen in one view. So you don't have to move up and down quite so much. So there are some sort of practical considerations that, that limit it actually more than technological ones. So there are devices on the market that do side viewing. They're just not very widely applied. Thank you. Yeah, that's what it's for. It's for flinging. Oh, you're not game for the, the long distance rugby throw here. Yeah. <laughs> How well they do in terms of what kind of measuring the radius in the vessel? Like it's not, not also I, I, I know that the classification can be difficult, but how well do they do in the kind of recognizing the tissue and doing the basic parameters? Um yeah, I suppose that sort of question is the like the classic um garbage. What? Sure oh, it decided to switch me off. It's like eight o'clock. We've got to go home now, it tells me. No. <laughs> um, the the computer-based classification, of course, has the challenge that you always need a ground truth to train it. So you have you're only ever as good as your human annotator. And I think the thing I would say is that as I kind of alluded to, human annotators are only human <laughs> and don't always agree, which can be rather a challenge when you're trying to do these things. So it, ac generally across biology, um, there are lots and lots of applications where you can go to fully automated computer controlled um, evaluation. So we have um, applications in the lab where we take tissue sections and we stain them for different parameters, and then we just uh, throw uh, machine learning at them to classify them. And that's easy because we have lots and lots of samples that's within our control and a PhD student can sit there and tell it what's good and what's bad and it'll do re reasonably well. Um, the problem comes when you get to these kind of um, like clinical studies, for example, where we don't actually have that much data. Um, and we also don't have a, go a very good annotator <laughs> in order to perfect it. So we're still at the very much the garbage in, garbage out stage in terms of the clinical interpretation with, by computer. But in the more kind of histopathological um, state um, and in some of the broader studies that we do, it's very, very amenable to do it by computer. One nice thing that you can do when you um, use machine learning based approaches is that you can combine the, the data-driven approach with simulation-based approaches. And what we found recently is that if you can do a physics-driven simulation of the optical interactions that you're measuring and feed that into a machine learning-based approach, then your computer is much better at interpreting your experimental data because it knows something about the optical interactions that are happening. Um, and there it actually can compensate for some of the artifacts that we measure in our spectral data. So it's a kind of a long convoluted answer to your question, but like in summary, like, no, we're very far from having a computer interpret, but in the research grade, in the, in the academic lab, we're actually very using them very regularly. I like the way you delegated the throwing there. <laughs> good throwing, good catch. <laughs> Yeah, so everything I showed you today was just absorption based because that's the easiest thing to measure in a clinical environment and it's also the strongest signal that you can measure with the light interacting with the tissue. So there are many other different spectroscopies, as you've alluded to, so vibrational spectroscopies um, and fluorescent spectroscopies, et cetera. Um, things like Raman spectroscopy, where we have these vibrational interactions with the molecules, give us a much more chemically specific picture. So we can really see the distribution of different biomolecules within the tissue sample. However, it's an incoherent scattering process that happens in like one in 10 to the seven photons that are scattered in the tissue. So it's a very, very weak interaction. So if we measure it through an endoscope, which you can do, um, you do get data. Um, you have to get, get around different difficulties in having um, Raman's um, signatures and fluorescent background from the fiber bundle that you do the, the imaging through. Um, so you get very disease specific um, signatures that way. 
but it's quite slow and it's quite weak. And so as a result, it's then quite hard to think about a uh, clinical translation of that sort of technology. So we use it in my team when we're asking biological questions in kind of cell cultures or tissue receptions, but we don't tend to apply it in the actual clinical studies because it's a you'd have to have your entire lab dedicated to just doing Raman in <laughs> endoscopes in order to make that an effective uh, way forward, I think. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you showed, um, it does sound weird, uh, you showed, showed the response peaks of your uh, uh, Fabier Perot uh, mm -hmm. sensors, uh, and you still chose to do RGB, but then the extra uh, side peaks, they were still really close to the original beats. Uh, is it then possible to discern any difference for your hemo, uh, for your oxygen saturation or like? Yeah, because you're actually, they're close together because then you can bin them, but they provide you separate samples in a region where the spectrum is changing quite rapidly. So you do actually measure something discernible. We have done studies where we've had like those test objects with blood flowing with different oxygenations and you can see the changes in the absorption through that. But you can also think about just chucking out the white light and focusing directly at, on the wavelengths that we think are interesting based on the optimization algorithms that we've done, but the clinicians might not like that so much. So you're still we try to keep them that. happy, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. How do we deal with the um, variability between the patients? Is there a good set of realistic that we measure well, I think there's different ways that you could approach this in a clinical setting. So I think the if you were trying to make some sort of classification, you would not do it in a population sense. So, you know, in the current clinical environment, they have a set of qualitative metrics that they then apply to the whole population of people that they see. I don't think you would do a quantitative cutoff to the whole population. But you could use the fact that the normal tissue has much less inherent variation in it across patients as a way to, to normalize or standardize if you wanted to then kind of extrapolate from a reference data set. Um, I think the more useful way to do it is actually to make a more of a biophysical measurement to actually extract these indices that are um, like related to the vessel radius. And if you have, you always have a normal healthy esophagus to compare to in that patient. So if you know broadly, that the, the total blood content goes up in disease and you have your normal healthy tissue to compare to, you look for increases in that um, relative within the same patient. So I think you would try to apply a sort of an internal control, intern, internal quality control on a per patient basis if you were trying to look at a way to interpret rather than doing a kind of population-based classification approach. I don't think that would work from the variability that we've seen at least. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I'm wondering about something about the safety issues of applying this uh, technique. Yep. To, uh, so, so basically, if you use a relatively wider range of spectrum or whatever on the normal tissues inside the human body. So there are kind of internationally accepted um, guidelines around exposure of skin and eyes to incoherent and coherent light. The coherent light is like the, the legal requirement. There's a generic standard for incoherent light. Um, and that describes the damage that can be done to tissue as a function of wavelength. So the limitations of how much light that you can put on your tissue um, depend on the wavelength of light and the duration of the exposure. So if you get out into these redder wavelengths, um, you'll be aware that you'll start to get thermal changes in the tissue with the more light that you apply. Um, so you have to make sure that you're below the thermal thresholds in order to apply the tissue. However, those thresholds are relatively high for the wavelengths of light that we're applying. And within the visible range, the way that we do it is that we measure the light that's um, given out by the standard endoscope and we stay within that power range. So we don't ever exceed what's done by the commercial um, clinically approved endoscopes. And that keeps us within the, the respective power range. Of course, if you go then out into the shortwave infrared, you start to get like further into regions where you might have different damage thresholds. Uh, but again, you can use the reference standards for that. We also have a relatively short procedure. So the kind of wavelength times time type equation. Um, 
um, can be adjusted depending on how long you're exposed for. So essentially we just adhere to the international guidance. It's not perfect. And I kind of alluded to that um, at the end of the talk because it's defined for skin and eyes and we're illuminating an esophagus, which is not skin or eyes, but there are no defined internal exposure standards for internal organs. So you can use lasers to cauterize tissue when you're doing minimally invasive surgery. <laughs> I clearly don't want to use that much power. <laughs> I don't want to cauterize the tissue. On the other hand, um, I don't want to be so low that I have a poor signal to noise ratio and can't compensate for it. Um, so we kind of have to use uh, our, uh, our knowledge of the skin and eyes. I mean, the esophagus in terms of cellular types is not so dissimilar from, from skin. So we can make an extrapolation that whatever's good for skin is probably good for that. Okay, there's someone behind you. Uh, hi, thank you for the great talk. And I'd like to ask, uh, are there any congenital um, abnormalities or variants that would um, enable the patient not suitable for using the acute that you're proposing? So, for example, that we have much more chaotic um, distribution of PROs, or conversely, that their neural growth is much more structured? It's a, a good question to which I don't really have a good answer. Um, I know that there are several um, hereditary conditions which predispose people to have a higher risk of developing cancer in the gastrointestinal tract. We haven't done any studies in anyone with those conditions because they're relatively rare. So you don't get many patients coming through the clinic. So in our experience of doing trials, there was no one that we could recruit under those um, cases. Um, if the kind of the underlying kind of normal is different from what we're used to seeing, then there may be less distinction between the normal tissue and the disease. Um, but the only way we'd be able to test that is actually by doing it in those, those patients in those disease groups. There are also um, diseases that occur in children that um, affect what we, we're measuring. So we've done some very preliminary studies, not in, um, not in children, but in models of childhood esophage esophageal dysphagia, um, where they have abnormalities in the in the food pipe and unable to process food down into the stomach. Um, and those um, model systems show that there are differences um, with our endoscopy approach. So I think you would have to do an optimization kind of in those different specific patient groups um, when you're likely to see them um, coming through into the clinic. Thank you. Um. I don't know if it's going to be a very opinion question, but uh, as far as, so first of all, how thick, uh, what's the sort of typical diameter of a fiber optic bundle um, and that you could use to sort of do this uh, imaging for me? And sort of follow on question, but I, I understand that, um, or I, I believe that there's quite a lot of imaging using stuff like keyhole surgery mm -hmm. and um and you're using this for a sort of in parallel with endoscopy for the esophagus and head on but presumably if you were if you were sort of attaching it to keyhole surgery yeah. and the procedures would you be able to use similar techniques in more difficult to reach locations and do sort of similar uh analysis of perhaps in regions of the body where there might be cancer, um, sort of suspicions of cancer growing there. Yeah, absolutely. So I should start by saying first that there are no such no such thing as ignorant <laughs> questions or simple questions. If if you didn't get it, it's because I didn't explain it well enough. Um, in terms of the uh, diameter of the fiber optics, the bundles that we use are typically between a millimeter and two millimeters. You can use fiber optics for imaging that are actually ultra thin single. Uh, uh, single fibers like multi-mode fibers and you can get down to a couple of hundred microns your image quality um, uh, trades off because you have to use the modal propagation of the fiber to reconstruct your image but that's a whole other story I could spend an hour talking about um, relating to the keyhole surgery so the interesting thing in laparoscopy is that they typically use rigid rods so the challenge for us in endoscopy is that they have a flexible device so you have to propagate your information through a flexible device. It's actually much easier to do this in laparoscopic surgery because you can have a relay lens system down a rod 
And that's typically how they do it in laparoscopic surgery. More and more now they have chip on tip, the same as we have in endoscopy. Um, but traditionally they would do it by having a, a, a lens relay system in a, a hollow rod. Uh, the, the minimally invasive surgery that you were referring to is, they, they call, that's the, the scopy, there's endoscopy, colonoscopy, <laughs> arthroscopy, there's always a scopy and it's, that's laparoscopy. Um, so the imaging that we've, we have applied has been done in minimally invasive surgery by other groups um, at Imperial College, for example, at the Hamlin Center, and is being done commercially by groups at Intuitive Surgical who make the Da Vinci robot for doing robotic surgery, for example. So they do multispectral imaging, but they typically um, will then will relay it out through a lens system. So it's kind of an, an easier instrumentation problem to solve because they can do that relay or they can do chip on tip and do it with RGB. So there isn't a commercial device that does it yet, but the companies are interested in, in doing this optical property estimation and quantification. And they're taking slightly tangential approaches to do it. Um, so what I've described here is measuring the spectral reflectance of the tissue, um, but it doesn't directly measure the actual absorption and scattering coefficients of the tissue that underlies it. There's another approach that you can use um, called spatial frequency domain imaging, if you're interested to look it up, where instead of just shining uh, uh, light on the tissue, you actually modulate the light that you put on the tissue. So you can imagine like if my presentation was showing um, black and white sinusoids, I can apply um, uh, sinusoidal um, variation uh, to my um, illumination to make a structured pattern. And if I do that with different phase shifts, um, I can actually look at the demodulation of that sine wave as it propagates into the tissue. And by some magical mathematics that you can look up if you're interested, you can actually invert that to extract the optical absorption and scattering coefficients. And you can then do that in a wavelength resolved manner. So you can really connect to the actual optical propagation of the tissue as opposed to the measurement that we, we make, which is a somewhat a quick and dirty measurement because it's a diffuse reflectance where we collect everything that comes back um, from the, the tissue over a, a relatively large volume from the way that we do the fiber optic measurement. Um, so that's something that we're also interested in as an aside, but I didn't talk about today, but there are other people that have done it in much greater detail than me. And I bring it up because one of the companies doing minimally invasive surgery is doing their spectral measurement through that, um, that methodology. You get to throw it all the way to the bottom. <laughs> I'll try and field it <laughs> in case it comes my way. Oh, <laughs> not a good catcher. Oh, sorry, today I'm a mathematician, and this is a medical sort of related question, so I'm very bad at this. Um, you said that <laughs> sorry, some of the cells are completely left like anaerobic or without oxygen. So um, I've been thinking, wouldn't my burden be a better thing to um, imagine that case? Or would that be impossible because either the lack of my own there, or that since it doesn't give any conformal change when it's oxidized, it's not. No yeah, so you can measure the absorption spectrum of myoglobin. It tends to only get to the concentration range that is detectable in an exercising muscle. So if I'm like running up and down the stairs and you do some optical spectroscopy on my legs, you're likely to get some myoglobin signal. Um, but in a normal resting state human, the hemoglobin is going to massively outweigh the, the signal from the myoglobin. So that's why we don't typically look for that um, as an alternative uh, way of of, of extracting information. So it's usually in those kind of scenarios where you're going to get an, a, a reasonable amount of myoglobin to measure. Right. But you're right that it is an optically absorbing molecule that we could go after if we were sensitive enough to the change. Thank you. I was still thinking this, the humans might have a strong level of oxygen as well, like the cycle so. Yeah. yeah, so what they tend to do is goes down a, a glycolytic, glycolytic pathway for metabolism. So there are kind of two main biological pathways that you can generate your energy ATP through. Um, the, the typical one is the one that uses the oxygen. And then in the oxygen starvation conditions, then you tend to utilize um, this glycolytic pathway to metabolize glucose into ATP. So there's different like metabolic pathways the cell can take, and they just tend to switch towards the other one if they are in the scenario where they don't have access to the oxygen. Right, sorry, I'm really stupid. <laughs> no, not at all. It's a very, uh, very good question. Right, yeah, I think we are sort of running out of time, but um, we are thankful for all the questions and uh, for the answers. Uh, we are having some snacks. Feel free to just grab some snacks or like drinks out there and continue some informal. Yeah, thank you so much for all the great questions. Really nice to talk to you.